Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about writer's block. And I, I want to let you know that the slides that you're going to see are mostly pictures, but I will be posting um, detailed notes on my website that you can uh, look at and, and download after the um, program. So um, I'm going to talk tonight about what writer's block is, what it isn't, what you can do about it, and ways to prevent it happening. So um, let's get started. So writer's block, um, what, what exactly is it? It has been defined um, in the um, Oxford Dictionary as an inability to begin or continue writing uh, for reasons other than a lack of basic skill. It's not related to whether you've got a fractured wrist or um, other things that are preventing you from writing. It's, it's a stoppage, a hesitation. It's about composing. You're having trouble composing your writing. And as someone calls it, a mysterious composing problem, an inhibition. Um, Edmund Bergler, who was a psychoanalyst in New York City, he was Austrian, and he followed Freud. He thought that writer's block back in the 50s um, was due to oral masochism or withholding of mother's milk. Um, and of course, we don't think that anymore, but we don't know exactly what causes it. And there is no pill that you can take so you don't ever get writer's block. There's no um, cure. Uh, it, it's not as well defined as you might like, but we do know a fair amount of what works for writers to prevent it and to deal with it when you do get it. Okay, who gets writer's block? Well, although there are some writers who don't believe in writer's block, who claim it doesn't exist at all, um, most people believe that pretty much all writers face writer's block at some time or another. They have um, maybe a blank page in front of them. They don't know where to start. They can't get geared up. They're overwhelmed. It's very frustrating and uncomfortable. Uh, we find writer's block across the centuries. We find it in all cultures, languages, different groups. Uh, it's, it's a fairly universal experience. And um, Flaubert, a French writer in the 1800s said it, uh, and I'll translate it. He said, you don't know what it is to stay a whole day with your head in your hands, trying to squeeze your unfortunate brain so as to find a word. So um, he pretty much uh, describes how uncomfortable it can be when you are experiencing writer's block. So, you know, we'd like to not have that happen to us and prevent it. And you have to wonder, like, how can, how can you uh, stop that? So um, there are ways that multiple writers have found um, help them not get stuck in their writing and, and to become a, a fluent writer and um, just kind of go forth most of the time. And the one way to think about this is writing is a creative activity. Writing, just like all other fine arts and art, uh, is making something out of nothing. It's putting disparate things together in a new way. It's being unique. And the idea that you can't always be unique or that it might require more effort um, makes sense if you think of it that way. So, you know, you can see here, these are examples of people being creative um, in the arts and in the crafts. You know, they're making baskets, they're painting pictures, they're doing ceramics. And one thing you'll notice is that all of these activities do have certain substrates, certain uh, forms and standards that they adhere to. But then on top of that, there's a need to be um, different and special. So um, creating those sort of connections is, is a brain activity. It's not, um, 
an athletic action. It's not a sport. It doesn't happen. Uh, it's not dependent on being mobile uh, or having a, a fully intact um, skeletal muscles. You know, we've seen people who've had um, disabilities or um, different abilities who, who yet are very able to create wonderful things uh, using words. So it is a brain activity. And when you think of that, you want to remember that um, your brain functions best if you take care of it. So um, if you want to be a high functioning writer, you want to do what you can to make your brain be high functioning. And, and this may sound um, basic, but it's true. Your brain needs food. Uh, we know that your attention deteriorates um, when you're hungry, you know, uh, we know that if you're poorly nourished, you don't think as well. And so you can't expect uh, to be putting out really high level writing material if you're not um, feeding yourself or feeding yourself properly. So the more you can pay attention to good nutrition, that's a great thing to do. Now, um, your brain needs sleep. And so we know we need sleep for everyday activities, but there's an extra need to be a writer to have a well-rested um, body. And the reason is that since writing is a creative activity, when you sleep, your brain is doing uh, reparative work. It's fixing itself, your whole body is, is recuperating, but you're also, there's a part of your mind that is working on problems as you sleep. And you may or may not have noticed this, but um, for instance, if you're doing algebra problems, you might get stuck on a problem and you just cannot move forward. Well, sometimes when you sleep on it, you actually, the solution will come to you when you wake up. And you may have noticed like when you're in that um, coming out of rest um, situation that you'll have particularly um, ideas that are, that are appealing or seem to be solutions to your problems. Some writers will keep a notepad by their bed so that they can record these thoughts when they um, awake or they might use their phone to do a phone memo but definitely, um, if you're well rested, you're going to be set for making uh, creative uh, writing that's useful. And we have, um, if you wanted to think about like how important uh, a healthy brain is to your writing ability, you can always look at the flip side and there was a woman, Alice Flaherty, she's an MD, a PhD, and she experienced bouts of what's called um, hypergraphia when she was postpartum. This happened to her more than once. And she just had this overwhelming need to write and write and write. And um, it was felt to be definitely related to a physical issue that she had. So um, just as you can have an abnormal level of writing that she had from a problem with her brain, you can also go the other way and um, have difficulties writing. Now, um, writers, we'd all rather prevent a problem than experience it, and that's a lot more pleasant. And, and there are specific actions that you can um, take with your, um, to prevent writer's block and to keep writing. So um, one of the most common things you'll hear from writers as a recommendation is to write daily. And you hear this um, from all sorts of people. And, and the fact is that if you do write daily Writers who write daily or at least write on a regular basis and write frequently are less prone to having writer's block. Uh, this is likely because 
um, it, it it's the, the it, because it's more of a habit. Um, it's just easier to do that. Uh, Stephen King certainly is a writer that we've all heard about, and he's a proponent of regular writing, um, you know, and things like that. The other recommendation and things that we know that will help you avoid um, writer's block is to read. And you read for several reasons. One, you read because it'll increase your vocabulary. If you take the time to read and look up words you don't understand, then you're going to build a bigger vocabulary so that when you're searching for the perfect word, uh, you're gonna have better choices and you won't be stuck just using a thesaurus. Um, sometimes it's better to just have these things at your fingertips. The other reason or the main reason to read is you, you get to experience how other writers um, attack the problem of communicating their stories. There's nothing wrong with copying, not to the level of plagiarism, not word for word, but certainly um, being um, following the types of tools that other writers have developed. So you want to read and read widely. And you can see all the different ways that people um, use to communicate their story. So reading is a great way to help prevent uh, writer's block. One of the more important things you can do to help you with your writing, and um, it does more than prevent writer's block. You get a lot more benefits than that, but you participate in a writer's group. When you participate in a writer's group, you're going to develop um, a network of other writers who have experiences different from yours and have knowledge and can help um, you when you want to um, publish your book to know how to publish it, where to go, do you self-publish, do you hybrid publish, all those sort of um, business questions, you know. Um, but they also, more importantly, can help you by critiquing your writing, you know, reading your writing and uh, giving you feedback uh, on whether they understand what you think they should from what you're writing. You know, are you making sense to them? Did you communicate adequately? And then when you listen, uh, if you can take turns, you know, sharing writing, reading it out loud, um, you'll really be amazed at all the different approaches that your fellow writers have and all the different ways they write and the subjects they pick. So um, you do want to, at a minimum, participate in at least one writer's group. Now, um, to find a writer's group, you can certainly uh, use all the social media tools that are available for identifying groups that meet in person um, close to you. You can also find writers groups. Sometimes they're totally virtual and they've been this way for like years. Um, it, it's not necessarily just in the last few years that people have had virtual writers groups. You can have online groups. Um, you can have, um, you can find groups by word of mouth. You can uh, maybe uh, if you're subscribing to a writing magazine, you'll be able to identify some groups. But uh, pretty much any place in the United States has some writers groups and some are small, some are bigger, um, but they are a good tool. Uh, here in Loudoun County, seniors um, meet at Percival's Carver Center and they also meet virtually now uh, as a writers group. And you'll see the man on the left has uh, three of the books that the group has published together their anthologies and um, it's led by Bobby Carducci she's on the right uh, so you have some writers groups are general writing groups some are for certain age groups like there's been teen writing groups that can get together um, and then others are based on genre like mystery writers romance writers and um, history writers uh, I belong to uh, 
a writing group called the Hellenic Writers Group of Washington, D.C., which is like a niche group. These are Greek Americans and Greeks and people, maybe they married a Greek or they just like the culture, but they're interested in Greek life. So um, this group was started by Patty Apostolides. You can see her picture here. And she has written books in English. Uh, she immigrated when she was a very young child. And so she's fluently bilingual and then had her books published in Greek as well. So this writing group, um, I find it very helpful uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, uh, one reason is that many of the members are bilingual. And so when I, um, and, and I don't really speak very much Greek at all. So when I write an English story, um, if I want that audience to understand it, I have to meet a certain level of clarity. So um, you'll find that if you're in a group like any of these, you'll develop relationships and you'll have people that if you, or if and when, since everybody pretty much experiences um, uh, writer's block at some point in time, you'll have somebody that you can talk to who can help you. And they can help you in a lot of ways. Um, you might uh, talk to them and have them read your material and then they'll give you ideas on, on how to proceed or just by talking, you'll feel better. So um, this is an important thing to do. The other thing you might do as prevention for writer's block is to tap into science. Um, as I said before, there's not a lot that um, has been delineated um, definitely about writer's block, but, there, but we do know a little bit more, or especially if you look at it as a creative activity. Uh, there have been studies that have shown that um, it's, it's a contrary kind of concept, but that if you're a night person, you know, you think you're like a night owl, that's when you're at your, your best. Or if you're a morning person, they find that some of those problem solving activities or cognitive skills are easier if you are attack them during your off time. So if I'm a morning person, which I'm not, but if I were a morning person and I had some problem in my writing that I wanted to deal with, according to this research, you would be better off trying to do it at night, trying to do it at your off time. And I'm not, you know, they don't have a reason for this. It may well be that you're more task oriented during your, um, optimum time, but you can do that circadian rhythm uh, change and see if that helps you prevent your writer's block. The other thing you might try, for instance, is um, science has found that uh, the aroma of peppermint helps improve your attention. So if I'm flagging while I'm writing and I want to keep my alertness, I just use peppermint gum. So these are things that, you know, you can follow the cognitive um, science and get some little hints on, on things that will help you promote your creativity and, and avoid um, blocks. An important part, and um, this has been felt to be one of the three most important parts of preventing writer's block is to have a goal, to know where you're going and have some plans. You don't want them to be too specific, but you want to have a sense of where your writing is headed, what your story's point is. Otherwise, you risk just getting totally lost and sitting in front of a blank page because you, you really don't haven't thought ahead as to where you want to go. So um, know where you're headed and use um, planning and strategies and organize. Now, there's different levels of organization. Some people plan very carefully before they write. Like if they're going to write a book, they'll lay out every chapter and all the characters and everything. Uh, and maybe that's how you do it, or they might just have a general idea. But you do want to 
plan and have um, effective strategies for your writing. Otherwise, um, you may end up blocked. The other part is to um, have goals and to uh, consider breaking down your writing um, project into smaller pieces. This is a well-known management goal, like when you're faced with a large task, to break it down into achievable bite-sized pieces and just take it like one step at a time. Uh, certainly, if you're going to write a book, you know, um, there's so many moving parts that you do want to like have um, small parts and and celebrate when you do make progress. The other thing that can help you um, as you're organizing your writing project is to recognize that each genre has its own conventions. And these vary by culture and uh, groups. So, for instance, um, romance in America, generally, they want a happy ending. Fairy tales want a happy ending. The princess and the prince need to get together in most fairy tales. Mysteries usually have a red herring. Um, and if you follow these genres and these conventions, uh, that can make it easier for you as you set about doing your writing. If you go against the uh, conventions, it, it, it can lead to um, problems. So for instance, I always think of the movie Summersby, which was Richard Gere and uh, uh, Jodie Foster. And it was a romance. Unfortunately, it was a French romance. It was based on a French story. And the French had no trouble killing off the um, the lover at the end, Richard Gere. I think he got hung, which in American uh, romances does not fly. So um, that would be an example of going against your conventions. Uh, and I'm not saying you have to be trite or anything, but you do want to try to pay attention and, and work off the, the standard conventions, at least when you're getting started. And one way to do this is to tap into templates. If you think about it, most um, stories have a rhythm. And if you can identify what the rhythm is and then slot your work into those sections, things will go easier and you'll be less likely to uh, face um, writer's block and any number of problems. So for instance, there's a book, um, Save the Cat, for novelists. And Save the Cat um, is just exploiting those um, templates in American novel writing, the way we like to see our novels set up, you know, which is a rising arc of action, you know, a crisis, and, and then another crisis, and then a quick resolution. And you'll find, like, if you, when you watch movies, when you watch TV, when you read books, things follow the same rhythm. So, so to make life easier and um, make your writing more fluid, you can follow those templates. Doesn't have to mean that you always have to do it or that if you've got a really great original idea later, you know, that um, is contrary to that, you wouldn't want to try it. But um, when you're getting started or um, when you have the, the ability to, if you follow these templates, uh, it can help you prevent um, frustrations as you write. One of the other large areas, according to um, many studies on um, things that cause writer's block is premature editing or premature revision. And I think everybody's guilty of that at times, you know, you're writing and then you stop and you go, oh, wait a minute, that's the wrong point of view. I, I have to go back and fix that. Or I'm not sure how to spell. Uh, personally, I get confused between 
English inclusion, American inclusion, and I can never remember if gray is G R A Y or G R E Y. And if I let myself stop, it just disrupts the writing flow. Okay. You know, I'm looking up things and, and maybe, you know, you're writing something that's a historical fiction and you've done most of your research, but as you write, uh, and certainly I've been guilty of this, you go, I'd really like to know exactly what year that happened in Maryland, you know, and, and you stop and you look it up and uh, you've disrupted your whole process. So most recommendations are to just write. And if you hit something that you um, want to find out later, uh, you know, excuse me, if you hit something that you don't know and you're tempted to stop what you're doing and go look it up, don't do it. Just put in a parenthesis or, or put in a little asterisk or some personal sign that you're going to look this up later and just keep on writing. So um, avoid the temptation to write a paragraph and then go back and work over that paragraph and then write the next paragraph and then work over that one and then go back to the first one and look at that again. That reiteration will um, really impede the flow of your writing. You're much better off understanding that um, you can use spell check, you can use Grammarly, you can do all your checking after you've written the whole thing. And you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to review it several times and revise it. But the first time, don't get stuck in that. All right, hang loose. You want to avoid rigid rules. Nothing kills creativity more than um, my fifth grade art teacher, okay, with a red pencil changing everything. Uh, a teacher who uh, has so many rules that you just can't move. And sometimes we internalize these or try to follow them ourselves and um, think like, well, the first sentence is the most important sentence of the press release. So I have to make sure the first sentence is perfect. And I'm not going to do anything until that first sentence is perfect. Well, that can lead to um, problems. Okay, that can cause blockage. Although there are some writers who um, I'm thinking of Nora Ephraim, who who wrote like that when she was a journalist. She said she had to have the first sentence before she could proceed. But sometimes it would take her five days to get the first sentence. You're much better off not getting hung up in these really rigid rules when you're writing. Write the whole thing, then go back and, and fix your point of view disparities or your um, other problems. Certainly I find like my first sentence, I just write what I'm supposed, you know, what I'm trying to write, what I'm supposed to write. And then I look at it and think, well, what should the first part be? What is the most compelling or the most in, um, intriguing part? And often I'll find that down in the body of what I've written. And then I just pull it up and move it around. And, and we can all thank goodness we now have word processors and we're not writing this stuff by hand. But um, yes, do not get hung up on rigid rules. So again, um, if you had to say three things that would prevent um, writer's block, it would be good planning, avoid premature editing, and avoid rigid rules. Now, an another way to talk about this is a term called heuristic, um, well, heuristic work, which means that rather than uh, have to be perfect all the time, you're going to go for something that solves your problem right now that is practical. It's not guaranteed to be the very best, and it's not guaranteed to be perfect, but it does the job and lets you move along. So, sometimes after you've done, or not sometimes, 
guarantee, even though you do everything you can to prevent writer's block, you're going to get stuck. Uh, there's going to be something that you just don't know where to go next. And um, what can you do about that? Well, what I did was, you know, I'm here in Loudoun County, so I asked some local published Loudoun County authors what they did when they got stuck. Or for, Well, first I asked them if they did get stuck, and they all said they did. They all had writer's block from time to time. So uh, Linda Siddig is um, a writer who writes predominantly um, historical fiction, although she has written some uh, nonfiction as well. This is a picture of Linda with one of her um, early books cut from strong cloth and I, the other pictures are her at a book signing in Percival. So what Linda does is when she gets stuck, she goes for a walk and she tries to go for a walk someplace where she's around nature and she um, lets her mind just kind of, you know, be open to what's around. She also takes, she used to take a notebook. This was before we had um, the ability to record audio on our phones, but now she just takes her phone. And so when she's on the walk, if she sees something that's interesting, she records it on her phone and makes a note of it. She does the same thing when she's going about um, her day, and then she collects these ideas and, and keeps them on hand for when she's looking for inspiration or something that she wants to um, address in her writing. So Linda's action is to go on a walk. Well, I have to say that um, a woman who was getting her master's in um, psychology, I believe it was, she, um, let's see, I need to look at her name, is Sarah Ahmed. She got her, she wrote her master's in 2019 about writer's block. And she found, she did a little study. She uh, worked with over a hundred writers and these were not um, just students. These were people up to 78 years of age, people who had published books, people who aspired to publish, uh, people who were active in writing groups and organization. So she tried to get as much as possible seasoned writers or, or people who were likely to um, have experienced the writing life. And of those, and she asked them about their experiences with writer's block, and she found that 100% of those who exercised or went for a walk when they were blocked uh, found it to be highly or very helpful. So um, some people do a yoga when they're stuck. Uh, they might do any kind of um, exercise, just a brief um, period. And, and that makes sense because um, it lets you divert your attention from the problem, uh, bring in some endorphins, and it's just a great way to um, open yourself up to creativity. Now, Dixie Ann Halage um, is a publisher and a published author. Uh, her latest book is Breakfast in Palestine. And I asked Dixie Ann um, what she did when she was blocked. And she changes tasks. She always has um, uh, things that she can do. So she just doesn't, you know, keep beating her head against the wall. She just changes and moves on to something else. Um, and she un and she also understands that her first draft is crummy, and her quote she gave me a quote is perfection is a journey, not a destination. So Dixie Ann is all about um, not getting bogged down uh, when things aren't going exactly right in the one area she wants to go. Uh, this is the method I personally use. I define writing very broadly. Um, writing to me includes my writers groups. It includes looking for images to illustrate my um, nonfiction articles. It includes um, taking pictures for my articles or looking for a cover, planning a book launch, uh, invoicing, you know, it, it includes a number of mundane activities that have to be done, filing, organizing my work, 
um, going through and changing things. So when I get stuck, I do what Dixie Ann does. I just pick something um, to do connected with writing that um, is more achievable. There's those days when you wake up or as you go through your day when you're really not at your best for doing a complex, um, clear-headed, creative activity. And you're much better off just recognizing that and moving on. And again, um, Sarah Ahmed and her master's thesis found that shifting tasks was a common uh, solution many writers used when they were stuck. And that um, she said about 55% of people who shifted tasks found that that helped them. Now, Sheila Ralph is um, a published author. She is a PhD nurse clinician and has published um, clinical books. Okay. So now she's working on uh, writing about her grandfather, Vic Sparks, who was an artist, and, and she's holding one of his works there, and, and that's one of his works to the right. So um, currently, when I check with Sheila, Sheila is stuck. She's, she's blocked, and what her um, solution is, is to take a break. She has a, a definitive time that she's going to um, not write, and then she's going to come back to it. And that, again, can be very effective as a way to deal with writer's block. It's to walk away and do something else for a while and let, let things kind of work on their own uh, and find some solutions. Now, and that is the take a break picture. Now, other people will write their way out. Maya Angelou um, wrote, she would continue writing, but if she wasn't feeling it, she would write nonsense if it took days. The cat wears a hat is a mat. You know, she would just, she, she didn't want to like not write, but she just wrote whatever. Some people uh, do free writing, meaning they just do a stream of consciousness writing. Uh, when they're stuck, and they just do that until um, they're out of their um, snit or whatever. Now, another technique that can help people uh, when you're in a rough patch with your writing is the Pomodoro technique. It's a management technique, actually, an Italian um, developed it in the 1980s. 80s. And in this um, technique, it's all about focusing. So, <clears throat> excuse me. To do the Bahamadora technique, and I have done it, and I found it very helpful um, until I settled into a regular writing habit, is whatever your task is, if it's writing, you're going to write for 25 minutes. You're going to set a timer, maybe on your phone or on your um, oven, whatever. You set the timer for 25 minutes, and for those 25 minutes, all you do is write, okay? And you don't check your email, and you don't go for a walk, and you don't get a drink of water, and you don't talk to your um, child, you know, or, well, I mean, if you had to, you would, but it, but you would always come back in 25 minutes. And then you take a five minute break. And then you go back and you do 25 minutes more. And after you've done like three or four of these 25 minute segments, then you take a longer break, about 15 minutes. And what the breaks do is they help you refocus um, because you can't sustain 100% attention indefinitely. So this breaks it up but you will find that you can get things done. So um, if you're having some uh, sketchy times with your writing, it can really help you focus and be productive.
Now, um, our master's student who did the studies with the hundred and some writers also found that talking with another writer was one of the most effective ways to get out of writer's block uh, as the writers reported to her. 67% of people who were blocked who talked to another writer or engaged with another writer um, found that it was effective. Now, this is a picture of Dixie Ann Halage and Lenora um, Good. And this was from a, a writer's retreat in El Paso. So um, Lenora is on the other side of the continent, but she's available. She's available by email, she's available by text, she's available by phone as a writing friend. So um, if I get stuck, I can contact Lenora, okay? And that can be really helpful. Now she helps me with critiquing my work or editing my work and all sorts of activities. Things that people do um, include, they might have brainstorming sessions, maybe just with two people or three or the writer's group. Um, they might ask someone to read their stuff and, and uh, tell them what they think about it come up with a title, you know, any number of things, but it has been found to be very helpful to talk to another writer. Now, if you're doing all this, you know, you, you, you're eating right, you're exercising, you're getting your recreation, um, you're sleeping, but you're having trouble repeatedly with, um, writer's block, it might be time to go see your doctor, okay? Uh, sometimes you can have physical things that uh, affect your ability to do problem solving. Let's say if you had diabetes or um, any number of like cognitive issues, uh, you might have anxiety that or depression. Uh, these are things that deserve a physician or a healthcare provider's attention. So if you continue to have um, persistent, recurrent uh, writer's block or trouble with your writing, then, then really consider just double checking with your doctor, make sure everything's okay. Now, the other thing to think about is if you have a, a one project and you just cannot get through it. Maybe it's not a good project, okay? Maybe what you're trying to write about is just something that that's just a it's just a bad idea or it's a premature idea. It might be something that if you let it sit, and sometimes these things I'm sure you've heard of this, writers will let projects sit. They'll they'll put it in the drawer for years or at least for a while. So um, if you're kind of beating your head against the wall, nothing's helping with what you're writing on a particular project, then set it aside, but don't throw it out, okay? These little nuggets, um, they sort of never end. Uh, you just keep them and then you can incorporate them later or you might have a better idea later of what you wanna do with them. So um, certainly uh, just it's fine to set them aside and, and let them kind of um, mature. Okay, well, um, I hope this has helped you with some ideas about how you might address writer's block. As I said, I'll be posting uh, notes on my website so that you can share those. Uh, the thing to remember is there is, um, a lot of interest in writer's block. It's pretty universal. Uh, we all get it. Uh, it does go away and we're still learning a lot about it. So um, be sure to check back uh, later with cognitive science and, and with um, psychology and all those people who try to help us um, with our creativity. And thank you. <laughs>